So if we look at our own production line, right? We've got the drug discovery process going all the way from target ID through to clinical trials. And then we've got various, um, what I kind of think of as the tools workshops, right? That have to make things for that production process to go through. So we have target identification, and then we um, have like obviously the target validation, hit identification, hit delete, and so on. Now, target ID in this particular production line, that used to be the bottleneck, right? It was the process of painstaking academic research into the fundamental mechanisms of disease, which would then point to some aspect of physiology, which meant that we'd then be able to think, okay, this could be a target. And then that would be published in a nature paper or something, and then that would be the starting gun for all pharma to then rush to try and drug that target, right? So the whole of our production line is set up along those kind of dynamics, right? So this is where we come to the first impact of AI, because AI now, one of the successful use cases, I think it's fair, fair to say, is the identification of potential new targets, right? So instead of that painstaking research, we now have ridiculous volumes of multi-open data sets. I was chatting to one leader of R&D, a big pharma company, and he was saying, you know, they've got 6.3 million patient genomes, just as one part of that multi-open data set. It's insane. It's fantastic. And so what that means is that AI can then be put to the sort of thing which AI is very good at, and humans are very bad, right? Which is taking those huge sets and trying to find patterns within that, which could then be useful. They can provide you know, some suggestions to humans as to, hey, these could be good targets. This, alongside the fact that there are new modalities coming through, like say protax and nucleic acid therapies, uh, which mean that anything can be a target, right? It used to be that a target had to be something that was nicely drugable. These days, anything can be a target, and AI is identifying pretty much anything and everything. So this means that then we've got this kind of build-up of targets from target ideas. Now, no longer in these like separate academic institutions, it's, it's within the companies themselves, but you've got this build-up of targets behind the door, if you like, into target validation. And it puts a huge criticality on the functions next. So target validation is massive, right? Because how much can we trust the targets that might have been identified by AI, we don't really know yet until they actually get all the way through clinic, we won't know. But also then, what we found talking to folks who are actually in these departments, that parts of my assay development in particular are slammed, right? Because all of a sudden, they've got more targets, and those targets are more diverse. So they can't lean on their experience. Like, it's not like they're gonna do their 13th kinase assay of their career, right? Like, all of a sudden, there's much more diverse things that they have to deal with. So AI has solved the problem, and it's caused a new problem. And I think the time when AI is actually going to have a dramatic impact on our, our own production line, if you like, is when we can actually unbottle uh, these parts all the way through the whole value chain. Right? So AI caused the problem. Could it help us to solve the problem? Well, I'm an optimist, so yeah, I'll say yeah, yeah sure. Um, but I think the way that it, it would need to be done is that we need to be building you know, very specific models in those functions which help with those functions, right? So for assay development, we should have assay development models which are using all the data from all previous assay developments in order to help inform us about the next assay development, get that firewall turning, right? Um, Interestingly, I don't think, and it goes back to a discussion we had in the previous Q&A, I don't think necessarily that you have to integrate these data sets with everything else. I'm not sure we need one data set to rule them all, right? Um, you know, primarily the use of that data about assay dev is mostly useful in assay dev, right? It's not actually that useful for identifying new targets, for example. Although maybe if there's some targets which you just can't develop an assay for, that might be a useful bit of feedback. But overall, these data sets could be largely separate. So we could have very specific models in very specific places that help supercharge these currently very messy and difficult to standardize um, functions. Right, assay dev is not something which you can kind of standardize, automate, and just crank the handle on. Right, it's new science every time a new program comes through, and that's really challenging. Fundamentally, it's all about the data. And this is almost like a, a trite truism at this point. But maybe where it's a little bit different is I'm not talking about 
fair data. Um, I'm talking about qualities of the data which maybe we're overlooking at the moment. And fundamentally, I'm talking about the kind of data that we need to address the complexities of biology. And I don't think this is something that we think about enough. Right? Biology is an emergent system. It's developed over four or billion years of evolution. And evolution has absolutely no obligation to be understandable or to make a system which can easily be unpicked. And so what that means is that any biological system is the combination of lots of different things coming together to produce a particular phenomenon. And unless we can understand that convergence of lots of things coming together, we won't understand biology. We can't just do this on a reductionist basis, pick it all apart and expect to understand how it works. But unfortunately, this is the way that we are all taught to do science. And every scientist in all of your organizations will be taught to do science this way. I mean, I went to my daughter's uh, parents' evening uh, about six months ago now, and you know, I went straight to the science book, because obviously that's the most important one, right? And I'm flicking through, and there in there is this idea that, oh, to really understand whether something's having an effect on your system, you have to hold everything else constant and just vary that one thing. Right? Which is absolutely fine for teaching to my nine, now ten year old daughter. I have no problem with that. I kind of wish that it would move on a little bit from there, though, as we go through maybe the higher levels of education. So let's just think about for a second what one factor at a time, as it's often known, or just doing one bit at a time might actually mean. So we'll choose a factor, let's go for temperature. We'll put a design where we're investigating temperature. We're going to look at it from 15 degrees to 30 degrees. We're going to get some data, and we're going to plot those data on a graph, and we're going to put a line through those data. We're going to say, ah, it looks like our optimal temperature is 25 degrees. What else could have a, uh, an effect on our system? Or a pH. pH could have an effect on our system, right? So we're going to have a look at pH, and we're going to look at 25 degrees, because that was our optimal temperature, right? And we're going to get more data, and we're going to graph them, and we're going to put a line through them. And we're going to say that this is our optimum. All logical, right? You'd never usually see this plotted this way, by the way. In any report, there'd usually be two uh, graphs, one next to the other. So it kind of hides the assumption inherent in all this is we've just taken two cross sections through a multi dimensional space. And actually, the response surface that this data represents could look like this. And we simply wouldn't know. We're blind to the way that these factors might interact, i.e. what if the optimum pH depends on temperature, right? And in biology, we know from long experience in synthase and many of our clients, that actually these interactions are everywhere. So if we're not investigating in a multi-dimensional way, it doesn't matter if our data are fair or not because they're not sufficient to actually understanding the complexities of biology. So I think that there's this whole other thing about you know, what kind of data we're producing, which is something that maybe as a community we're neglecting a bit. Right. So what we've been thinking about a lot is what does it take to transform the experiments that you can do in the lab so that we do get the data that we want, so that we can get these flywheels going, right? So this is what one factor at a time looks like. It's often uh, abbreviated to OFAT, right? So imagine we have a landscape that we're exploring, right? And we take our two cross section through the landscape and we very happily come up with the optimum for that landscape, right? And you know, as we've seen from the previous slides, that's a dangerous assumption to make, but it's an assumption that a lot of our scientists are making an awful lot of the time. It's the assumption that I was making as a scientist before I started using multifactorial methods. So then we can use design of experiments, right? And this is kind of what I've been referring to obliquely up to this point, which is where you do multifactorial experimental design. You're looking at many parameters simultaneously. It can be done. You just have to use a systematic statistical framework for doing so. And then all of a sudden, you unlock all of these kind of filigree ways in which biology interacts with itself to produce the phenomenon that we see. And this is pretty cool. And it's really very powerful, and it means that we can very systematically work our way towards a local optimum, a true local optimum, not just one that one factor at a time has tricked us into thinking was correct. But actually, what we've seen is then, if you then apply digital tools plus automation, you can take the bar still higher, right? You can do even more dramatically powerful experiments, something that we call high-dimensional experimentation, which basically maps the entire space um, in one go. 
Um, and this is pretty exciting. Um, honestly, like uh, it's the biggest thing that we found at Synthase, uh, both ourselves and with our clients, that actually these kind of experiments are possible and they can cut through biological complexity with a speed that just wasn't possible previously, right? Um, we've been fortunate enough that some of these clients have got up on stages much like this one and talked a bit about it so you don't just have to take my word for it. Um, I particularly like the um, title that Helena put on this slide. Um, incidentally, the data that she's showing here is where they looked at 75 different conditions to see if they could change the uh, dissociation constant of a particular asset. Um, the answer was no. You can't change the dissociation constant. They wanted to, but they couldn't. And it's interesting that she still chose to present these data because it was a negative result, right? But it was a definitive negative result. So then, you know, they could go back to their stakeholders who might helpfully have in their mind, oh, have you tried this? Like, yeah, we've tried it. You know, we've tried all of the things, none of it worked, let's move on. Right? I would argue that the only failed experiment is one that gives an ambiguous result, not that it gives us the result that we didn't necessarily want. Right? And the issue with it is we're all too familiar with uh, failed experiments under that definition. Need it be that way. So this is kind of what it looks like. So this is one of Helene's slides. So if you look on the left-hand side of the slide, you see this kind of cloud of dots. Right, those aren't data, those are design points within that three-dimensional space. So it gives you an idea of what one of these multi-dimensional designs could look like, but you know, where, where you, each one of those dots is varying across those three, three uh, different parameters. And what that means in practice is that you have a hell of a lot of repetitive, right, of exact proportions for every single well, where every single well is different, right? Which if you're trying to do by hand, if you're trying to even work out what that takes, in your head or on an Excel sheet. Well, good luck. I mean, we did it in the early days of Synthase, it wasn't fun. Um, so what you need is a digital tool that does all that planning for you and then makes the automation instructions and then runs it on the automation so that you can then get the data and build models. So in this case, it was actually using a design uh, ex experiment package called Jump. It's a statistical package. Uh, a lot of people use it. Um, these days, you can do this within Synthase as well. Um, it should you choose to do, you know, like follow like a simplified workflow. Uh, Jump still has its place, it's still very, very useful for a lot of more high power designs. Um, but the outcome of this is it's all run in one plate, so you can see the plate layout. You've got negative controls on the left and positive controls on the right. And immediately you can then determine your assay window for a, a multitude of different conditions, in this case, 154 different conditions. Um, and what that allows them to do in a single experiment is identify the optimal conditions for running that assay, but also identify where you could run it for half the price that you otherwise might have used. Because you can see, oh, it's still pretty good, so in the, the, where, where it's labeled two, that is half the um, amount of a very expensive reagent, so then you can run it a lot cheaper. Um, GSK have been using this for doing, or attempting to do some very complex multicellular models. So this is, in, in this case, for cardiotoxicity. Um, you know, I think one of the most exciting applications of this kind of thing is to think about how we might be able to make ever more clinically relevant um, in vitro models. Right? I, don't, I think it's something that people haven't really focused on enough. But like, again, we can do these hugely complex, uh, complex experiments. We can then run them on relatively simple automation, like the Dragonfly, which we've got on our stand out, out, out in the uh, hall. Um, and the cool thing about this is the assay is actually that you know, the cells start spontaneously beating in the dish, which is just like super great. Um, but essentially what it means is you, is you set up your experimental design in synthase, you then go and run the automated experiment, you can bring those data back together. We've had some, uh, a lot of talk about metadata recently. Because we programmed the automation, we know exactly how each data point was produced. Right? So you can then take the raw data, combine it with the experimental metadata, exactly how those um, data were produced and then you can go straight into analysis and work out what's happening in your system. This is another example of an assay development, and it's done by an undergraduate student who was on placement at GSK. And she did a series of experiments which were more powerful and definitive than I'd usually expect from a completed PhD. And she came and presented them in synthase and I was blown away. She also did our marketing for us because she did a really nice impact part on her poster, which just shows exactly uh, the effect of uh, running these kind of experiments. Um, for me, like, you know, so those kind of outcomes are very common, right? And it's really gratifying 
but it's mostly about you're getting definitive results in biology. And that for me is what got me completely addicted to this way of working um, and why I'm very excited about it. Um, so if you were to ask me what the lab of the future should be, then it should be running these kind of experiments, getting very large multi-dimensional data sets, giving us true insight into biology. But then what happens not on, for that experiment, which has made that program move forward faster with a better assay, which is not to be underestimated, right? Better signal to noise throughout your entire discovery process, fantastic, right? But what about for the 30th assay? What can we do with those 29 multi-dimensional data sets to tell us about the 30th assay that we're trying to run? And I think in that way, we could be developing these flywheels within these really critical, these mess, the messy parts of discovery. And that should unbottleneck the bottleneck that's already been caused by AI. Um, and that way we're going to get the full benefit from this new technology. And hopefully it won't take us 50 years. <laughs>